Mayuri uh, Bunim, and um, I started with Guruji when I was, I'm trying to think now, 21 years old when I started with Guruji. Before then, I was uh, studying with Chitraleka Bola in Birmingham, and uh, very much, uh, you know, at that time, uh, I was moving. I was about to get married and move to London, and I was saying to Chitraji that, what shall I do, because I can't imagine giving up Bharatanatyam or dance, and, and I couldn't see myself commuting every day between London and Birmingham. That wasn't going to happen. And I knew then that I definitely wanted to take uh, dance professionally and take it to the next level. So she recommended uh, Prakash had a good day. She said, go and see him. And thankfully, they were really good friends, both of them. So the transfer between one guru to another guru happened very smoothly for me. And I remember when I first came to the Bhavan in 1991, um, I was also performing with Chitraleka Bola's company at that time. Uh, we were doing a piece called Lokanatya. So we were performing at the Bhavan as well. So in a way, it was really kind of nice that we were here, she was there, and I'd already started classes with Guruji. Um, and so they'd had a conversation. She told him about me. And you know, so all the conversation happened between the two gurus. So when I went from Chitraji to Guruji, it was a, a big moment for me. And um, so what I found was working at, under Guruji, studying under him, was a revelation because I felt that the law of the teaching I found very structured. Like, for example, learning all about the hastas properly, the shlokas, the theory, having exams at the end of it. There was a kind of structured way of learning. But also it wasn't for me just coming out weekends. I was very, you know, very upfront, very clear that I really wanted to take dance professionally and not just do once in a while a few productions or something. I was very much committed by that time when I moved here that that's what I wanted to do. So he took it very seriously too. He was aware of that. But I, that's all I'd said. And then I really left it to him and just dedicated my time to just study as much as I could. So it was coming to classes at weekends. I felt I lived at the Bhavan, like the whole Saturday and Sunday. Um, I came at the week, uh, weekday classes on the Wednesdays. And then he also asked me to come to other classes that were, he was holding in other places in London. So there was another class that was being held at the Catford. So I was having several different groups of, you know, going to classes wherever they were happening to just go and learn as much as possible. So looking at the, a lot of the senior students that were there at that time, people who were there, say, two or three or four or five years ahead of me were learning. I found it very inspirational to really look up at the other students and see, is this the quality of the dance? I've never seen so many before. Because in Birmingham, it wasn't so prolific. There were like small groups of people, but not suddenly it was like a big change. Everybody's dressed in traditional half saris, which wasn't the norm in Birmingham. In Birmingham, for example, you'd wear your salvar kurta, you know, the trouser, and, uh, and that would be sufficient. But here, there was, a, there was like a uniform you had to wear, <laughs> the white and red sari. You know, just, just the idea, the concept of a discipline, of how you arrive at a class was quite a, a revelation for me, because that was not something I was used to. And um, so how long have you been studying with your Guruji? It's been 20 years now. And when did you do your Arangir? I did it in 95, 1995. And that was... Um, it's about four years after studying with him, and um, and it, and I never said to Guruji that I want to do my Arangetram, but he knew from my commitment and the way I was attending. And I also felt to myself that I'm never going to say to him, "Can I do my Arangetram next year?" <laughs> or "When is this my Arangetram happening?" I, I I really felt that it had to come from him. And at one point, I remember thinking he's never going to mention anything. <laughs> Maybe I'm going to be here for 10 years or 11 years, and he might not say it. But I was prepared to wait till he said to himself, to me, that maybe we can start thinking about training towards your debut performance. So training for a debut performance with Guruji means that you have to do a puja. And I remember Mataraji, who was the um, director here before, and the Kumarji here. He, um, a ceremony happens. Once you make a commitment, he asks you that you're going to do your Arangetran. You have to do a sankalpan, uh, a vow. And, and the vow is done as part of a service in the temple. And it was a very beautiful ceremony. I remember doing that. I remember feeling really, making that commitment and saying that I will uh, make a vow to 
study hard, to be conscientious, to really put my 100%, more than 100% effort into this and dedicate myself to learning this form and really doing what my Guruji tells me. And there's a beautiful ceremony that happens. And then I, I still have, and where I go touring, I still carry this um, uh, Mataruji gave me from the puja. It's a silver um, image of the Ganapati, Lakshmi and Saraswati joined together. And that was given to me as a, you know, like a token for that vow that was made on that day. So then a year's training began, which was really just really learning. And Guruji goes away and he thinks about you. He really looks at you as a, your personality, your character, where your body moves. He really understands, he already understands how you are going. So he thinks about items or pieces in the classical repertoire that might be suited to your nature, to your character, that will help to bring the emotion out, to help um, bring the character of your dance out. And when he was just speaking earlier, I was really struck when he said that 18 is the right age. And I thought, okay, I wasn't that far off. <laughs> I wasn't that far off that age where that's when the interesting thing happens. And also I was under the age of 30, you know, well before that. So it seems to have happened at the right time in age and what he's talking about for something to happen. Um, uh, so the training was really interesting. Um, and, and the training also happened, like, for example, he would invite me to um, rehearse with a very senior student of his just to up the standard, to create a competition environment in this space. He said, look at them, look at how you've got to be. This is the standard we need to reach. I was also going to a couple of other Arangetrams that were happening at that time, you know, so you knew that what you were aiming for, you know, in terms of quality or, uh, you know, how people presented themselves. So by observation also, you learned that how people communicated the form and how that translated into movement was very interesting. Um, and then also about learning the text, going deeper into the text of each piece was very interesting for me. I, at the same time, I had taken up learning Sanskrit and Tamil. Maybe it was a way I could understand the language better because my mother tongue is Gujarati. So I, you know, Gujarati songs uh, are not in the Bharatanatyam uh, repertoire, a classical repertoire as far as I know. And so to help me to get a better understanding. So I, I really enjoyed learning Tamil and Sanskrit to supplement the studies around uh, the study of Bharatanatyam. And also doing a lot of additional reading. I mean, the bookshop's over there. <laughs> I used to live in it. You can ask Shivanesh and Uncle that I used to just go and scour the books, listen to all the music, really get as informed as possible, just through love of dance. And, um, and also, we were very lucky at that time. I went, attended all the summer schools, and all the summer schools were very interesting because, because of that, I was able to appreciate the, the differences and the nuances between the different schools of Bharatanatyam. So, for example, you would see uh, one year you might see Chitra Veshwar coming and doing her style, uh, Alarm El Valli, uh, Malika Sarukai. Um, I remember one day Ram Gopal walked in and and I recognized that it was Ram Gopal when, uh, I mean, I didn't recognize him, but when Guruji said, this is Ram Gopal, uh, I'd been reading his book for years. I, I never thought that I'd ever meet, meet, meet him. So suddenly he turns up at a rehearsal and, and he talks about how to do the overhead prop properly. The overhead, which I call, is the one where the arm goes from the back and it goes over the head. <laughs> yes, it's that movement. And it was amazing just to see him demonstrate that, have an opportunity to sit down and talk to him a guru to go and, you know, be social, <laughs> be social, take him, you know, just sit with the people. So for me, it was, I was just, I was speechless. I, I didn't know what to say. Yeah, I just, just listened to what he was going to say. Mrilalini Sarabhai coming and giving lecture demonstrations. So it was opening my mind so much to these people who I'd seen on the book, but not to be here in this space while you're learning. And they talking about their food was like nothing. You can't match it. So in a way, there was always this part of me that felt you'd have to go to India to learn. But in a way, I felt that India came to, came to England. <laughs> and I felt that I didn't have to go that far, fortunately, to learn here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I like you. Yes, of course. Oh, brilliant. Oh, that's great. So you've got a whole batch of them. <laughs> you can keep them. About me also is there. Ah, OK. Great. I'll send it to you. Yeah, well, I, I, can, I can sort that out. I mean, I can communicate that with Guruji Great. and help Everyone. you. Some reason, some Thank you, yeah. Guruji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of all these people.
um, Udupi Lakshmi Narayan. And from each of those gurus that came, I learned specifically what was unique to them, which inspired me, like Jitharis Veshran, for example, opened my eyes to use of space in Bharatanatyam, which I'd never seen before. It wasn't just up and down and side to side. She transformed the use of space in classical work. And Udupi Lakshmi Narayan, for example, he'd made a whole feature, uh, you know, the sequences in Bharatanatyam between the gorves, between the paragraphs of the groups of uh, sequence of movement. You stand backwards and forward, or you walk back and forward. He'd made a whole feature of that in his uh, pieces. So learning that was a fantastic way. So, oh my God, there's more you can do with the gorves. And now we've come across as somebody who I didn't go to the summer school with, but Guru just telling me recently that he's got rid of the, the stamping back and forth altogether. So all the gorves are now back to back. <laughs> so it's like a super uh, uh, stamina to do that dilana. Um, and, and also taking music classes alongside it with Carnatic music, with Shiva Shakti. Guruji really emphasized that if you learn an item, it's very important you have an understanding of the text. You have the meaning of what, you, what it is. But also you should know how to sing it. You should be able to do the dalam properly. And if you're not able to say the chat is clearly, then it won't translate into your mind and into your body. So he put a lot of emphasis on that clarity of how you learn on all those levels was very important. And, uh, and I understand that. Because <laughs> I know he said if you go blah, 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 you translate immediately like that on your footwork. Um, uh, what else can I say? Um, and then examiners for the, when you do the diploma course at the Bhavan Center, they assign, uh, they invite guest examiners to work alongside Guruji to examine the students. So you you know, you have to go in at your allotted time. So you have a practical exam where you have to sing the certain songs and then dance certain sections, whichever ones that the external examiner asks you to do. So my examiner for the end of my course was uh, Shrimati Krishnamani Lakshmanan from Kalakshetra. And, and she was very strict. I remember thinking, oh my God, she hates me. <laughs> um, uh, I'm doing it all wrong here. You know, just, just the weight of her presence was incredible. And I remember Guruji's face being really encouraging and sort of say, don't lose heart, you know, really go for your, you know, exam and everything. So I really enjoyed the practical thing. Very scary experience. But then what those examiners then did was they would then present the summer school immediately after, you know, you've done through your exams in July. And then, the, then you'd attend a summer school with them. And they would also then perform something. And I remember her particularly because she was inspirational on many levels because she did things with so much dignity, with so much elegance, with so much clarity and um, there's a self-possession about her which is very, it wasn't, there's was no arrogance at all but she, there's a dignity which I just really respect. The way she presented her item suited to her age, suited to her maturity, I appreciated those things. Um, and, and, and I remember Guruji at that time, you know, because it was very much conversations as well, and I'd, I'd really pick his brains about things and get more of an understanding from, you know, outside the class. And he used to say that uh, developing a discrimination for yourself is extremely important. And by that, he said, you can only do that by observing and knowing for yourself and understanding for yourself. He said, I can tell you this, that, and the other, but you need to know for yourself. So he really encouraged this sense of discrimination and knowing what you like, developing your own aesthetic that is suited to you. He said, I can teach you these sequence of movements and these items and we can go through this. But ultimately, he said, you must never ever parrot me. Or he said, you have to make it your own. And for me, I didn't quite understand what he was saying at that time, but as years developed and I started working more creatively with the form and which he very much guided me, because um, I started choreographing classical pieces to begin with under his guidance. Not that I had any uh, agenda to go and perform them somewhere, but just to understand for myself what would it be like to choreograph your own padam? What would it be like to choreograph your own swarajati or your Ganesh Kautuam? So I did those things and I would go and show it to Nguruji I've, as an exercise. I've been listening to this music, I really like it. So I'd go and find out the meaning from the music teacher or from Guruji, or from Nandaji, somebody would give me a, a translation. And then I'd go away, think about it, make the work, 
and then show Guruji just as a test to see what his feedback would be on how I was using the gestures or the movements within the classical form. And, and sometimes, oh, so that's interesting. You know, you'll say, oh, I wouldn't use that gesture with that gesture because, <laughs> you know, he was like my kind of um, guide on the outside of how I was working with the form. And he was very much instrumental to that. So after the, uh, Aaron Getram was a big training. It was a big training because it's very intense. I remember being under eight stones. I didn't know uh, healthy practices of what it means to feed the body healthily. I wasn't really aware of that. So I suppose in that way, a lot can be done about that. And I think it probably is now. I know that the, the idea, the issue of healthy practice when you're in training and when you're working long hours in dance, um, there's something about how you feed the muscles and you know, really just a sense of um, healthiness. Also, he really encouraged me to um, always used to put me with the senior groups, you know, when I'd, even right from, you know, very early on when I'd started. It's just to take me out of my comfort zone. I, I, would, I, would, I would be really upset thinking, I'm not going to be able to keep up with this Dilana. <laughs> I don't even know that Adobu or that sequence of movement. And I, but I never questioned him. And he said, it's good for you. You just say, it's good for you. You stay there. That's where you are. <laughs> and, and, I, and I learned in a very uncomfortable way sometimes, you know, I wasn't always in a happy zone at all. Um, and I learned because of that. Um, even sometimes the senior students would look at me saying, why is she in our class? <laughs> I said, sorry, I'm really not trying to be in this class. <laughs> it was really much a bit like that. Um, and I respect him for that, actually. And I completely trust him on that, you know, because he knows how he can push you. And, and guide you, and he really has, I, I feel, and it still does. If I have any question, I know I wouldn't hesitate at all to pick up the phone or go and see him. And it's always like I've been there, like, you know, the, the, for a, a year training for my own get <laughs> You know, it feels like that with him. Um, so how does this now inform your present work? Guruji is one of my key influences because I think about it now and I understand it now in, in hindsight that he has such an openness and listening to his training where you know they were learning Kathak, Bharatanatyam, Manipuri, that how fluid and open he already was. He didn't, wasn't fixed in a particular way, um, but he made a decision that he was going to learn Bharatanatyam. In a way I did, you know, I did too, because I was learning Kathak with Nahid Siddiqui first. I thought I was going to study Kathak but I didn't, I, I really wanted to do Bharatanatyam. It was the one language that really spoke strongly to me. Um, although I love Kathak, yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, so he's influenced me in the sense of openness. Uh, he has a curiosity that he will look at everything. He has a, he really enjoys, and, and whatever, he, he's never like, we don't do this in our style, because his style is Bandha Nalur. He won't say, oh, we won't do this in our Bharatanatyam style. He'll say, you know, let, let the form evolve, take things that really, you know, make, make it richer or it, like, you know, he will, there's so many things he looks at other gurus have come from India and if he likes something that they do in their particular Bharatanatyam style, he'll make it his, he'll incorporate it, which is not exactly stealing or anything, it's really about taking the best of the best that it makes a sense to him to make the form grow within itself. And so it's in sense of openness, he's, uh, uh, I find it, inspirational, um, uh, not rigid, um, and he's set me free. He set me free where he's never been a guru that says you, you will not go and work with that person or you will not go and study with that person. In fact, if anything, he threw me out the door. He said, go and find out. <laughs> go and try it. At least you will know for yourself that whether you like it or not. This is it's really important that you know for yourself. And I didn't know how valuable that was, um, but I, li I really appreciate that he never stifled me or tried to stop me in any way. So because of that, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still with him. So you started up Anglica, didn't you? Yes, I co-founded that, yeah. Okay. So what made you embark on that journey? Um, it was a very slow, organic process. It wasn't something where I woke up one day and said, I'm going to now do Angika. <laughs> what happened was, after the Arangetram, Guruji put me with his uh, other senior student, Nina Rajrani. One of the trainings he gave me, encouraged me, was to go and work as a junior dancer with the company. And, 
and he was also co-choreographing some of her work so like you know she might be wanting to work on one of the first pieces I worked with was Golden Chains where Guruji is very much involved in quite a few of the scenes in that piece so or he'd be you know directing the photo shoot you know he's very much present at those things so it was very nice for me to have that uh, you know him with his you know most senior students and then me trying to learn <laughs> so it's like a fantastic um, learning curve for me um, he put me in productions in the bhavan. He got me to audition for the drama ballets that were happening in bhavan. So I participated in those, which used um, theatre. So that was really interesting as well. Uh, performances outside for traditional Bharatanatyam. And then, um, but then it really arose, the beginning of working in, in dance. I didn't know what, what the work was going to be or anything, but I started with like I said, choreographing within the traditional format. You know, I thought, what if I made a recital from A to B, but I really explored the single theme, just brought out the idea of the theme, that's the eternal theme of the soul seeking the beloved, always that happening. But how can I actually create a recital where you see the thread of that journey happen, ending it with something like a Mirabai Bhajan, uh, where you know, your sublimation is reached to a point of that uh, seeking. And um, so I choreographed these sequences of dance under Guruji's guidance was my first thing that I did. And um, I, I think I have, uh, I bought it. This is, uh, this is my first uh, thing that I did in Bharatanatyam. Um, and it explains the whole uh, recital journey, uh, which he guided uh, every sequence. And I performed those uh, uh, pieces. And then what happened? So still very much within the Bharatanatyam thing, but then it really started with a question. And the question being, what if I really jumped in space? Or what if I really covered A to B? This audible is meant to be like Akasha Brahmari, but this, I don't see any Akasha Brahmari happening, meaning lift off into the space, <laughs> you know, when you're looking around. So it just really started with small questions like that. And, um, uh, and how did this happen? It happened where we were asked by an organization, a charity organization called Kinoe, Kids in Need of Education. And they needed a Bharatanatyam dancer to go and perform. And by the time I'd called them back, they said, oh, we've got another dancer who's also called and accepted to do this job of doing a traditional Bharatanatyam piece for their show, for their gala, to raise money for charity. And the other dance happened to be Subhadra Subramanian. So we both performed this classical piece together as a duet. But what we had to do, because it was a solo piece, we had to find a way of developing it into a duet. So it wasn't like just two people doing the same dance next to each other, doing the same piece side by side. We decided to look at the sections of three items, four items I think there were. Uh, like for example, we did uh, Ganesha Vandanam, uh, then looked at you know, where the, who would do which part of the text in it, and then which of the pure dance could we do. So we started developing the pieces that Guruji had taught us both into a duet form, which we then performed. And that was really successful, and that got put on by people like Sampath for Kalki Kalaka, for the City of London Festival. Um, you know, we got to perform these classical pieces uh, as a duet. And that led to um, one day John Ashford meeting him on the staircase of the place, and him saying, oh, do come and talk, talk to us, you know. Who are you? Where have you come from? <laughs> you know, it would be nice to see what your interests are, what you're doing. It's, you know, you look really interesting. Um, and I still remember that meeting on that staircase. So I thought, well, let's, you know, go and talk to him. Because there's only so much you could do at the Bhavan. You know, like, they're very supportive. They gave you platform performances or go and do shows and things. Um, but this was, like, more of an opportunity to who knows what. So the first thing that happened was an application to Choreodrome um, to research an idea. And because the, the duet was really working quite interestingly, we thought, why don't we try and make a piece? Because everybody's saying, yeah, you two, make a piece, make a piece. We're thinking, OK, well, let's try an R&D something. And we had no idea how to begin. But it gave an opportunity to work with people. For example, I'd always wanted to work with. Uh, Shin Parvana is like a, an old friend of mine. We go back 25 years. you know. Well, a long time, 
and we've always said it'd be great if you were to able to make music for me. You know, he's from Birmingham as well, and you know, and he used to be the DCS Pangra band out there, so we used to always go and see his gigs all the time. So it's a good opportunity. So I said, you know, Shin, do you mind? You know, we're doing this choreodrome thing. Would you like to make some music for us? He said, love to. So he was a Pangra artist, but for him, the challenge was to make something for a classical uh, duet that we were exploring at that time. And he brought in a friend of his from the jazz world called Paul Timothy. So together, as part of Choreodrome, we worked to develop the, our first piece called Sudarshana, which we started researching and uh, developing. And we had a lot of good feedback from people like Kenneth Tharp at that time. And um, Richard Alston were mentoring that development of that work. And up then we applied to resolution because there was an opportunity to present the work if it was finished or developed at the resolution platform. So we put it on. It was just known as by our names. We didn't have a company name or anything like that. And it was, uh, yeah, it was very um, successful. It really, you know, made a difference. I remember Louis Hawkins was one of the mentors at that time. He was a promoter at Jackson's Lane Dance Theatre, and. I remember his feedback even now where he said, he said, for 10 years since I've been watching dance <laughs> and suddenly I've seen something that's made me jump out of my seat and thinking, where's this come from after all this time? And he said, oh, you should really go forward with this because I think the piece was fantastic. There's something really fresh out here. You should go further with that. So Angika's name actually, <laughs> which probably nobody knows, is to begin with, because we didn't have a name, but I remember making this application to the lottery, there was a lottery um, thing, Nazreen Rahman from um, uh, Aditi magazine, she used to be the director, oh, sorry, it's an alarm to remind me about something, um, uh, sorry about that, <laughs> um, uh, has said, you know, apply for this uh, lottery and perhaps you can get some money to make the work, so uh, we got funding to do that, our first funding. So on that, we were known as Aramandi. <laughs> Didn't have a title or anything, uh, or anything, because people were fed up of being known by our long, long names, and this is really dull. You could have a name that just people know. So it really came, always it came from the external, where people saying, you should have a name, and you should do this, and you should apply to this. And, um, but it was good because we're interested in the work, interested in working and making something. So by the time Armandi was awarded this uh, uh, money, we decided that's not a great title because we'll always have to be seriously sitting in that Armandi. <laughs> There's a big pressure on that one. Um, but also, it wasn't a great name. And then, you know, we found the name Angika, you know, just through brainstorming things. So then we became Angika officially for the first, I think, the first resolution performance. At that point till 98 or 99, was very much working within Bharatanatya and really looking at that form, asking specific questions about space or about a particular adobo, a unit of movement or a use of a particular gesture, and just really working very much by just asking simple questions about that form that may be, you know, I might be curious about at that time. But then there was a point where you begin to feel pressure because, you know, you're trying to uh, launch a career, you're trying to be working out there professionally, hopefully, you know, um, doing more work out there. And there was a pressure that, oh, maybe, you know, we should learn contemporary dance or we should learn other art forms so we can get more into, recognized into the mainstream or people accept us. Because it's very hard for traditional Bharatanatyam to go out onto the stages of the UK. It's very limited on what you would do or you'd always get into just the presentation on a very cultural India base, so you're very much the Indian, in the Indian costume doing that dance, which wasn't really representative of where I'm from, you know, where I'm, because I'm so much influenced by my upbringing, uh, I've grown up in this country, it's my home, England. Uh, so, you know, those kind of questions were very important, and, and as Guruji said himself, that it makes an influence. You can't get away from the fact that you, when you're going to schools in the UK, you know, you are in a different environment to the one that they try and create at the Bhavan, where you still know about your pujas and everything. Um, thankfully, I didn't have that because my mother was a very traditional religious Hindu woman, so I had a very strong uh, background where everybody observed all the festivals, the religion and debate of philosophy was a very important part of our work. Um, but in terms of contemporary dance, the question did come that maybe we should go and learn some other form. 
by then I'd already tried different things like uh, you know modern dance, gone and looked at um, you know ballet classes or tap, you know Bhangra folk dancing, creative dancing, Bengali theatre dancing. You know I've done so many different things, so it's not like I hadn't tried anything. You know studied Kathak, that kind of thing. Um, but because I'd gone through this training with Guruji, I had just done my debut performance of Arangetram. I'd done a work where you know, I was really looking at the recital form in a different way, what I could bring to that. I was very passionate about the form. And by just asking that question, I was trying to think, where does one even begin to learn contemporary dance? Where, what is the difference between Cunningham and Martha Graham? And you know, all, all those, it's like a whole different learning thing. And what is contemporary dance anyway? Exactly, exactly. So for me, I. I it was a very strong voice in me. I really wanted to stick with Bharatanatyam because I, I spent so much time learning it. I really wanted to dance Bharatanatyam. I really didn't want to spend more time going and learning another form. So just by that sheer reluctance to not wanting to learn something else and just really learning more about the form. Because I, I kept finding out that the more I looked at the form, I felt how little I know. And I felt that the more I looked at it, there was still so much more to do with it. Just to even just look at one gesture, I could spend hours just looking at it. I know it may sound crazy, but um, I felt it was very rich to me. So I felt that I could be studying this for a long time, and I, I just really wanted to spend time doing that. So that was a very clear decision, and I made that decision. I wasn't going to go to any other schools and try and learn any other forms, but really stick with Bharatanatyam. So what about your um, experience with the way McGregor's um, dance lifestyle? Oh, that, oh, that, so, so the point that uh, doing dance lines with Wayne McGregor after, uh, where was it? You know, after 12 years of working, you know, professionally in the dance world and going through many different kind of uh, challenges. Before Wayne, I've had my fundamental turning point was Jonathan Burroughs. And he opened my eyes to how I work with Parasnatum in the first place. And he still continues to have a strong influence on me on how I work with the form. Um, Wayne McGregor has come at a very interesting point in my career and in terms of, for, for me, his work, Chroma, is a benchmark piece where you can work with any classical form. For me, it shows that you can work with any classical form or any form fearlessly. You can do something very, very interesting. And that's the kind of thing I want to do with Bharatanatyam. How can I work with Bharatanatyam in a similar way with that kind of um, uh, uh, beauty and interest, physicality, the technical ability, how can that be brought to the fore that he has done with the dancers he works with? So that's the kind of thing that interests me. So doing dance lines with Wayne, where the, nobody was trained in Bharatanatyam Kathak or any South Asian form, um, I came at a fantastic point for me, because by then, because I have led a lot of workshops and master classes for contemporary dance students, the end of term BA projects at the place and all of that. What I often found, and I still do, is when I teach them sometimes the most minimal vocabulary of Bharatanatyam, and I set a creative task if I'm looking at a specific thing, I find that they are so free of the history or the, any background of what's associated with that language that I find it very refreshing that they use it in a way that I would never have thought of. So I wanted to try and work with people who are not necessarily trained in the South Asian form to see, can I take it a step further with professional dancers? Um, so working with Guruji in Arangetram was uh, a fantastic experience. I mean, you know, you, you just have to come here every day. You have to be around. So sometimes a lot of patience because he wouldn't always be ready for your class or for you or he had a lot of things going on. So you'd have to go away and practice, uh, think about your dance. And if you go back, he might be teaching another class. So you'd have to, you know, so there's a lot of patience building. And I think that the, there's another kind of training going on apart from just the dance with Guruji, I felt, with him. And uh, so, so learning, learning the items was really, really important. And rehearsals were really important. So there was a point that then you'd have a rehearsal on stage, then another point where you'd have a rehearsal with all the musicians. So all of that process was fantastic. Um, and what was unusual at that time was when we were looking at certain items, Guruji knew that I was you know, very creative-minded anyway. You know, he, he knew me very well, he knows me very well. Um, so he set me certain tasks, for example, like the Mai Adavu in a Dilana. He said, 
go away and creatively, you know, these are the bars, this is this many counts, this is the jati, go and choreograph just that section and show me what it looks like, yeah? Go and try it, you'd set me a challenge like that. Or if there was a sahitya in a varnam, for example, I was doing a, a, a varnam dedicated to the Hindu god Shiva, and I had to uh, create a, a drama, how I was gonna move in space, how I was gonna make that story come alive. So, and then he would guide me or he'd take it out and then make his own or, you know, but it was just a very fantastic way of guiding me through my Arangetran process to make those sections. Um, and the other thing, because I took the whole thing very seriously, I took the whole lighting aspect of it very seriously, the stage design of it, to symbolic use of colors and everything I took to, it was very important to me just because of the reading and and the concept behind the pieces. Um, and, but by that time, you know, I was married. So my first lighting designer <laughs> was my father-in-law. Um, he's, you know, he's a colonel in the army. So one of his hobbies in his retirement was to work in the theater and design lighting. So I remember he used to come to all my rehearsals, my father-in-law, and he used to make the notes, he used to understand the spacing, he used to understand what the concept was going to be, what we were trying to build out. And I remember at all these times when my father-in-law used to come in and my Guruji used to sit there, he used to give my father-in-law a funny look, say yes, mm, you know, it was like, <laughs> I think, oh my God, Guruji's like, why is he so weird? You know, like, this is not like Guruji. Why is he being so rude to my father-in-law? So I was in this really difficult position thinking, why is he being so funny? Because my father is English, or maybe he's English, I don't know. But Guruji's not like that. He's really open-minded. He's not, you know, any issues with people of a different race or anything. Um, but then what happened was when the Arangetram actually took place, and we did, a, we did such a big thing about the lighting, the set design, I found banners which were in the, in the British Museum's... Uh, they had a huge Indian museum festival thing, and they had these huge banners, which are all temple pillars. And I asked the curator, that, are you throwing them away? Or are you, can I buy them off you? Because they're, they're just the most beautiful things I've ever seen, and I'm a dancer, I have a debut performance coming. You know. And he said, you can have them if you can come and take them away from the British Museum. <laughs> and I said, oh my God. Okay, so I went around, I remember folding these things up, putting them in a suitcase. And so they became my set design for the um, Arangetrum. And then when Arangetrum happened, uh, the design was incredible, incredible how um, uh, Frank, my um, father-in-law, did the design for the whole thing. He didn't have time to change into a suit or anything. He was just like the technicians, <laughs> you know, all sort of like dirty, filthy, and like, you know, having rigged everything up. And, and then when the show happened, even Guruji, everybody finally saw what the lighting design was because it was all only in note form until he had been liaising with the theatre. And when Guruji saw the lighting and everything afterwards, he gave my father-in-law a really good handshake and, oh, and finally smiled at my father-in-law. And I said, Guruji, this is like really strange. What, what, what happened? He said, well, really, you know, these in-laws, you never know what they're going to, they might sabotage your, <laughs> sabotage your performances, you might do something. So he was actually fearful for me, not trusting these in-laws. They might pull an in-law type thing on me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like this worry came off his, you know, um, uh, uh, of his mind and suddenly everything was all happy again because he saw that he'd actually done a fantastic job. So, so the completion of the Arangetrum, what was your next stage? After the Arangetrum, um, I worked with his uh, student Nina Rajrani. I worked on a production with her. I worked on three productions with her as a dancer. I got a lot of training through that. Um, uh, one of them was a piece called uh, Utsa, which is completely uh, Bharatanatyam based, four Bharatanatyam dancers, including myself, Nina, her sister, and another girl called Sangeeta, who I thought was an amazing dancer. She probably still is. I'm not sure if she's still dancing now. And so it was like touring, getting work experience, working with a company, and then doing another piece called uh, Hidden Forces. And that was really special because we had an opportunity to work with the Dhananjayans who came from India, and we had a whole month of training class every day with them. They choreographed one of the pieces. So really having first-hand experience of working with these masters from India, being choreographed on and by, you know, learning works from them, uh, other Bharatanatyam pieces in classes with them every day. So that was a very, very special experience just to have that contact with them. 
and also getting an opportunity through Aditi magazine to interview them, to um, follow them around and ask questions, you know, so that was really great. Um, Aditi also sent me on things to accompany Alarm El Valley and her troupe when she was giving master classes. So it's a really nice way of hanging around with, with these masters, talking to them, finding out about them, their training, their way of learning, their thoughts on Bharatanatyam or any art form. It was a really nice conversational, social way outside the class or the training to get to know more about the feeling of the form. Um, and then after that, um, starting to do my own first work, the, the recital that, 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 you know, that I made, and with Guruji's guidance, very creative development through that whole year after that. And then working you know, with my first works as part of Angika at the place. And then, you know, and, but I've always continued, not just Angika, I've always continued working and developing other works alongside it, whether it's working in theatre or... One of the first things I actually did was working with the opera singer, doing Gustav Holtz's uh, Salvitri. Um, uh, my friend was an opera singer uh, called Matilda, and she, I made a piece with 50 students for that opera. We, it was just a, a one-off in a big church in Teddington. <laughs> and it was an I didn't even know that there was an opera called Savitri by Gustav Holst and that was an amazing experience to do and learning about the music and how to work with non-South Asian people to do a work that was very much based on a, a Hindu story <laughs> so or an Indian story. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of things that happened and rehearsals for that happened at the English National Opera Studios and things. So it's not coming to a whole different world and not even really being aware that this is where I'm at. I only see it now, but I didn't know then that's where these things were happening. And what about now? What about now? Uh, so I've um, uh, st started a new company called Atma and, um, and it's very exciting because I'm working with um, dancers I've worked with, say, for six or seven years, as well as dancers who I met as part of Dance Lines, who know no Bharatanatyam at all, but they're now doing the kind of thing that I was looking to do, uh, ex researching last year. Uh, so training them in the vocabulary that I want to work with in the piece. Um, and it's really about making, like I said, you know, Atma means, you know, the, the fabric that connects, interconnects all of us. It's the stuff that somehow there's a commonality between us. And for me, good art has the power to touch people's soul, to touch their, you know, touch the core. And I think in a way, this new company is really aspiring to do that, to really make something that's good. And, and that's enough. 